Hi everyone, thanks for joining us for the fifth conversation in the series. I'm Kate from BEAM, uh, we're a founding member of the Arts and Place uh, Consortium. I'd like to thank all the members that have been involved again, um, helping to create the series, the Art Fund for their support, and of course all our artists and speakers as well. Um, each talk is being streamed live, so if you have any comments or questions, you can use the live chat section um, and we'll pick some of those up towards the end of the conversation. If you want to carry on the conversation, follow us on Twitter uh, using the hashtag Arts and Place Now. Um, so now I'm really pleased to welcome Carolyn Debbie, Michael Piggott, and Sabine Cody Scabies. Welcome, everyone. Hello. So now I'm going to hand over to Sabine um, and enjoy your conversation. Thank you, and uh, welcome to yeah to this lovely um, conversations we are going conversation we're going to have with Carolyn, Debbie, and Michael Piggott. Uh, maybe we will start off with uh, introductions. Carolyn, do you want to start? Okay, sure. Um, uh, yes, I'm Carolyn Debbie, and I uh, make work under a collaborative umbrella called Sirens Crossing um, with artists from around the world. I've got lots of collaborators in, in Canada, in Sweden, as well as in the UK. Um, I think that's all I'll say for the moment. Thank you. And Thank you. my name is uh, Michael Piggott. I'm an associate professor in the film and television studies department at the University of Warwick. And I've been making work as an artist uh, of a sort since about 2010 or so. Thank you. And I'm Sabine cody -Shebitz. I'm Associate Professor in Architecture at the School of Art and Design at Coventry University. My particular interest is in urban design, heritage, placemaking, and I'm currently leading a project called Coventry Modern, which focuses on uh, Coventry's post-war heritage uh, leading up to the uh, City of Culture uh, 2021. And I got to know Carolyn and Michael through the Sensing the City project, a really fascinating project uh, which explored Coventry from an angle which is often forgotten or underestimated, particularly maybe in the architectural world, yet one we can all relate to. And I was very honored to be invited to be a responder to this uh, project, which gave me the opportunity to reflect on uh, on the, the project and on Coventry, not just from a professional uh, point of view, but also from an artistic and a personal point of view. Um, I want to give you a little bit more of an overview over the project Sensing the City. Uh, that was a, a three-year Arts and Humanities Research Council funded project, co collaborative project, which ran over three years from spring 2017 to spring 2020. And the project undertook a series of artistic urban studies in the city of Coventry. And Caroline de Bee, whose professional company is the London-based Sirens Crossing, and Michael Piggott from Warwick University's Film and TV Studies were two of overall five main artist researchers running micro projects under the Sensing the City umbrella. The project was led by Nicholas Weibrow from Theatre and Performance Studies at Warwick University, and other members of the project team were Natalie Garrett-Brown and Emma Meeham from the Center for Dance Research at Coventry University, as well as Nesha Jaron Trusun and Rob Butterby from Warwick University. The project uh, culminated really this, uh, this um, spring or a bit earlier in January 2020 with an integrated exhibition of artwork and performances at the Herbert Art Gallery at Coventry and uh, a one-day symposium co uh, called Sensing Coventry and Urban Salon. And what is interesting about this project is that it drew really on a number of methods ranging from dance-based practices to using film as a camera, as an extension of the body, to walking as performance. But overall, it was less about performing to an audience uh, than to engage the body uh, for its capacities to register and convey details relating to human senses in specific urban contexts. And the aim of this Sensing the City was also, and that's really particularly important here, clearly to entice a non-academic constituency of local users at various stages and in different capacities to um, find out how uh, the built environment, how the city has an impact on everyday lives of Coventry citizens. There are, uh, more, there's more, lots more information available on the website and we'll post the um, link uh, soon. 
And there's also an edited volume, Urban Sensographies, which will be published by Routledge soon. And I now have the pleasure to invite Carol and Michael to give an insight into their particular contribution of the project. And I'd like to start with Carolyn. Okay, um, I've asked Kate to put up a, a presentation that I've pre-recorded, um, but just to say that um, because my practice is performance-based, um, I, I had a lot of um, things that the, the project uh, resulted in quite a few different um, elements over several years. So I, uh, this presentation will try to give an overview of, of what happened in Coventry during Sensing the City uh, from my perspective. If you can put it up, Kate, thanks. I am a Canadian based in London and make work internationally with my company Sirens Crossing with projects largely taking place in Canada, UK, and Sweden. Sirens Crossing makes site-specific performances in cities. I am interested in how humans and non-humans might perform together and how the everyday life of the city is already part of the performance. In fact, given that the entire context is significant, we tend to call the work an audience experience rather than a performance. Our work hopes to enliven audience awareness of the city as an urban wild, a place where social, technological, organic and elemental systems are completely entangled and therefore part of everyday life. Commissioned by Sensing the City, my micro project was called Urban Flows Immersed in Worlds. The project benefited from an earlier pilot research period in the summer of 2016 and in 2018, a related project, which was a live Skype performance presented in Daegu, South Korea. Urban Flows had two main performance outcomes, which both took place in Coventry, the first in 2017 and the second in 2019, both in association with Coventry Biennial of Contemporary Art. So, in 2016, we had the pilot project. This was initially directed by interviews and walks with local Coventry people. I and my collaborator, Jayu Korti, then also followed our own intuitive wanders through the city. We were hoping to get a sense of how local humans connected to the city. The research was captured using reflective writing, interview recordings, photos, video, and bodily re-performance. Re the project culminated with an hour-long audience experience for about 10 people. So in 2017, we built on that pilot project um, by presenting performances of Urban Flow's You Were Here. This piece was devised and performed by myself and Jayu Korti, with a guest appearance by Mindy Chillery. The performances took audiences on a journey across several central Coventry sites. It, concluded, it included messages to audience by mobile phone, encounters with strangers, both human and non-human, travel on foot, and then a surprise taxi ride. Over 90 minutes, the audience followed clues, entered secret vantage points, left traces of themselves, and experienced shifts in perception with elements of the city reconstituted through sound and installation in the final site. Incorporating multiple locations, text, video, sound, performance, maggots, and mobile phones, the piece worked across multiple scales and registers, from cellular to cityscape, from machine systems to weather systems, from the poetic to the scientific. In 2018, we undertook Urban Flows and Experiment One. Here, four world cities were linked using Skype video call technology on mobile phones, with the audience viewing the piece on a large screen in Daegu, South Korea. Three individual performers with their mobiles were situated in London, UK, Vancouver, Canada, and Malmo, Sweden. The performers were simultaneously improvising with their own physical location, as well as with the Skype feed from their colleagues in the other two cities. During the piece, 
the three performers were restricted to staying within a two kilometer circular area of their neighborhood in their city, which was determined by overlaying a map of central Coventry onto each of the city neighborhoods in question. The experiment sought to create a, dis a hybrid dispersed city that incorporated all three places. In doing so, it revealed some of the ways that local and international real and vertical virtual flows might comprise the typical blended experience for humans using smart devices in everyday life. Many of us do this all the time. And we might ask between screen and world, where are our bodies actually? We, we brought that inquiry into performances of urban flows entangled in the grain of worlds becoming, which took place in 2019. This was also a site-specific performance in Coventry. In essence, the project sought to enliven, enliven audience noticing, to propose that all bodies, whether audience, performer, or passerby, are part of a complex hybrid ecosystem, a dense convergence of flows and mutual entanglements. During the piece, over two and a half hours, audience groups of 15 to 20 people undertook an experience which began on the 11th floor of a building overlooking Coventry city centre and its inner ring road tangle of motorways. The audience then walked a route through a variety of sites which were intermittently animated by the presence of ever disappearing performers, their fragments of text, sound or movement coexisting with the ongoing life of the city. At times, the audience were also asked to use their mobile phones while walking, engaging, therefore, simultaneously with both screen and embodied worlds. The piece passed by rewilded urban wastelands, under and over the ring road, entered an Ikea store, returned onto the streets, roamed along alleys and through parking lots, shopping malls and residential areas, past homeless people and their makeshift beds, shoppers and cafe customers through an industrial estate and finally arrived at an overgrown gated area of allotments along the Sherborne River. The piece concluded with audience, performers and crew gathered around a bonfire. The following poetic text will attempt to take you inside a few moments of the audience experience. The thought arrives imperceptibly. You are becoming exhausted, coextensive with this unrelenting rhythm of sense, encounter and interruption, pause and pulsed movement. At some point you realize a river is close, scent of wet, the growing chill. You realize you've known it for a while, blur of closed shop fronts, more traffic, a distinct move away from the center. What was that before? A feeling memory washes up. You remember being surrounded by vibration, a slowing hum coming in and out of phase, some sort of electrical sound, perhaps apocalypse. In that empty mall, you resisted the group's slowness your steps awkward and jumpy. Acceleration, you emerged into the street. A woman on the ground, a walnut tree. Two guys smirking on a park bench. You are walking, you feel two-dimensional. Another emergence. Road into tunnel, into darker, into tree-lined. Around you, Body voices converge. Suddenly you are in a river of bodies, a flow of murmurs shifting, rising, speaking, whispering, and then gone. The women are running again, disappearing ahead of you. Bats swoop past. A couple embrace on a distant balcony. There is a river close. Under acid bright lights, you are walking into darkness, breath held, felt, heard.
Yeah, great. Thank you very much, Carolyn. That was brilliant. Um, there's, there will be lots to discuss about that, but I think we'll, we'll just um, um, also hear Michael uh, to talk, uh, talk about his project or his project contribution, and then we'll have a bit of a bigger discussion. Yeah, thank you. Michael, do you want to start? Okay, um, so I have a PowerPoint. Um, right, thank you. Um, so uh, my part of the project was um, uh, uh, consisted of the making of um, a number of different films and sound recordings. Um, I didn't know how many I was going to make at the beginning of the project that emerged while doing it. But the, the thing I knew I was doing uh, uh, was taking cameras and microphones around the city and exploring it and using um, that apparatus, that technology as a means of investigating the, ur the urban space to then find a way of kind of reprocessing and presenting it at the end of the project. Um, I'll come back to that, that uh, film that you can see a poster of there, Coventry, Indian City in a minute. But before I do that, if I can move to the next slide, um, I also, so what I'm gonna do now is, is kind of rocket through um, some of the thinking behind it, some of the ideas that, um, that, that drove the way that I approached the city. But then mostly I'm just going to show you some examples of some steals from the films that I made and hope that it kind of all hangs together in a way that makes sense. But one of the key kind of quotes that I started with was from the filmmaker uh, uh, Patrick Keeler, who made London and Robinson in Space and was himself uh, a trained architect before a filmmaker. He says that filmmaking can operate as a form of spatial critique. Um, photography and architecture have a long um, and, and rich history of being uh, used to, together. Uh, one being used as an instrument of the other and one providing material for the other. The film and architecture, cinema and architecture has an equally long and entangled mm -hmm. history, but it's less um, less well articulated and less, less obvious sometimes. Films use architecture as material. Um, architecture uses cinema as a source of influence often. Um, but there's, but beyond that, there are senses, there are kind of more conceptual ways that we could think about <laughs> filmmaking being the creation of spaces and also architecture being the, the creation of, ex, of experiences. So there are, there are ways in which we can see one, one form as a, as a rough analog of the other. Um, so part of what I was doing with the project was trying to develop a, a way in which filmmaking, in which the moving image could be more methodically used to support uh, practices of architecture and urban planning. Um, the other quotes to jump from Patrick Keeler to another, to a, to a film theorist, uh, VF Perkins, um, is about the, the particular qualities of film. And this, he's not talking about documentary or urban space. He's talking about Hollywood film here, where he says that when watching a film, we concentrate on, on what we see more closely because we are not obliged to sacrifice inspection to involvement or flight. Or to put it another way, he says that we can observe the progress of a fire with much more attention when it can be neither our business to put it out nor our concern to escape, which I take for my purposes to mean that film offers peculiar conditions for considering the world as it was before the camera. Um, so part of what I was trying to do was to capture the city in, in kind of a conventional documentary way to some extent, although broad, um, using a lot of experimental uh, weird techniques as well in order to produce um, images of the, uh, of the city that could be considered in that um, peculiar condition of the, the cinema environment or sitting at home watching on a screen, whatever. The, the key thing is that it produces a particular way of paying attention to the world um, that often is not possible when you're actually there. But to go way back before cinema, um, I also want to mention some other um, imaging devices, some other technologies of uh, imaging that were influential uh, on me and, and, and my, my process. Um, the first of which is the, the panorama. Um, and this is, a, uh, this is just a, a, a few panels from the massive uh, Barker's Panorama of London from Albion Mill from the late 18th century, which was um, presented in um, the Rotunda in Leicester Square, which was a purpose-built building with windows in the top, no windows in the side. Um, it could house two 360-degree wraparound paintings, because this was before photography, before um, the moving image. Um, and the idea of the panorama was that it would produce a um, immersive, illusionistic recreation of a place, of a landscape, and sometimes of an urban landscape. Uh, here, And Barker's Panorama of London is interesting because it 
presents a view of uh, the city of London from a position on, in Southwark. Um, and um, arguably what panoramas of this kind attempted to do was to show you a city in the way um, that re revealed something about it, that revealed how it all hung together, how the politics and economy and processes and transport and people all um, fit together into a sort of a big jigsaw puzzle. And the panorama was a sort of a totalizing image that would show you the puzzle all at once and make it evident to you. Um, so this is a part of a long history of attempts to use technology to image the city, to show you it in a way that reveals something of it to you, that rep represents it in a way that tells you something about the city um, that may not be obvious uh, while you're there uh, down in the streets at sort of at surface level. Jonathan Crary says that these things, these panoramas provided an imaginary unity and coherence to an external world that in the context of urbanization was increasingly incoherent. So the other thing the panorama proposed to do was to put things back together again in a way that was understandable for an audience in a world where um, urban spaces were increasingly fragmented and incoherent. However, he also says that the panorama, rather than actually doing that, only really served to reassert the fragmentedness of experience. Because even if you were in that 360 degree immersive space, you, you could still only look at one bit of it at a time. As a, as a physical body that's sensing the space, you still had to move around it and look at the different bits individually and put it together in your head. So the, 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 the observer is still the active interpreter, is still the one who decides how it all hangs together. Um, another technology of, of imaging um, that precedes the, uh, the photograph and cinema by a long way is the camera obscura. And this is an image of a camera, the camera obscura from um, the Royal Observatory in, in Greenwich. Another way of looking at the world outside um, in a particular condition. So this is inside in the darkened room, the darkened space of the camera obscura, where an image of the world outside is bounced through a lens in the roof, in the domed roof, um, uh, down onto a viewing table, a circular viewing table that people could sit around and consider the world outside. Um, this directly influenced one of the films that I made, which was called Coventry Looking Up, which you can see there. This is a shot of the exhibition from January, where you can see several of the uh, uh, pieces um, from the project, not just my work at all. But mine is that little round table on the right there. Um, this was a 28-minute film, all of views uh, looking up at the, uh, the skyline of Coventry, at the vertical space, from a position standing on the road where a pedestrian would be. I took a lot of static shots of what the what the the rafters of the city look like um, to some extent, the, what the vertical space looked like, and then um, projected it, kind of perversely projected it downwards onto a viewing table to, I guess, re register in, in, a, in, a, in a limp kind of way, the camera obscura. Um, part of the, one of the driving ideas was to simply wander around, to loiter, to spend as much time as possible becoming kind of embedded in the city and allow the city to, to, to determine uh, what what the films would be about. Um, however, um, I did use one particular document as a kind of a guidebook uh, or a, a starting point, and that was the Future Coventry pamphlet that was produced after the war as part of the public-facing drive to uh, rebuild the city, or to imagine how the city might be rebuilt. And it, it, it really um, kind of manifests the city architect Donald, Gib Donald Gibson's plan for the city. Um, so part of what part of the, uh, what, what I was looking for um, were traces of this plan um, to see how it came about and how it didn't, uh, how it was compromised, what the results today are of it. Um, and another quote that I that I kept ringing in my head was this one from Douglas Murphy, where he says that the modern ruin is the discovery of a lack in the present, a lack corresponding to a potential future that only existed in the past. Um, so these images of a utopian vision of the future of Coventry, um, here's Broadgate, what it uh, might have looked like and does to some extent, but also doesn't. Um, these are images that also led me to go to certain places and look for certain things. Um, the kind of questions I was asking were, um, what is this place? How does it work? Why does it work in this way? How does the whole relate to the individual pieces? Who or what is it for? And sometimes, how might we imagine it functioning differently? What other things do we want it to do or make possible? 
So in a roundabout way, what I was trying to do was to create a, a kind of a weird 21st century panorama of Coventry that would accept the fact that it is fragmentary and perspectival and malfunctioning and not doing what it promises to do in many ways. But in doing so, it, it, it would kind of mirror the fragmentary experience of, of people every day in the city. So it's a panorama that's spread across a number of different films and, uh, and other artworks of different kinds. Um, Coventry Radiant City is a, 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 the most conventional sort of feature film length piece that, 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 that looks like a film, um, at least in the sense that it's about, about 80 minutes long and you can watch it on one screen. Um, it's made up of long static shots of spaces in the city. Um, there's only one really mobile uh, shot in the film. Um, the rest of them are quiet and observational, um, and they're culled from uh, hundreds and hundreds of, of shots. So um, it, the, the process, the practice, the methodology that I was using was was to do with wandering with a camera and ma making a lot of images of the city. Here are some other shots, and um, they are static in that they're locked down on a tripod, but things do happen. Processes move in and out of the shots. There are many people, as there are many people in, in this shot in particular, um, and other things move, other organic things and non-organic things move and do things and slow slow processes happen and fast processes happen. Another one of the films that, that moves quite a lot is For the Road Can Be a Thing of Beauty, which is a quote from The Future Coventry um, in the section that's about the design of the ring road. And this is a film that's a kind of a structural film. The, the rule of this film is that it's one long take. So there's no editing in this film. Um, it's one, although it's, although it's two screens, there are two cameras, one mounted on the front of the car, the other uh, in the back seat, looking at the passenger in the, in, the left, in the left passenger seat who's reading the future Coventry. And the car drives around and around the ring road for as long as it takes to read the future Coventry. While we look at the, while we experience the city from the perspective of the ring road, driving around it, and then also occasionally looking in uh, through the passenger window into the center of the city as we um, circumnavigated. Another uh, of the films was called uh, A Catalogue of the Great Buildings of Coventry, which is four hours long um, and exists as kind of more of an installation. It moves very, very slowly, although the camera is moving constantly um, using a, a sort of a pseudo microscopic uh, lens, um, a macro lens on top of a, an 85 millimeter, which gives you this almost microscopic um, image of the surfaces of the city um, and also a very narrow uh, focal plane. So it's a very nauseatingly woozy swimming image that moves in and out of focus and I, I, I think is quite sensory in that respect. It gives you a sense of proximity to these surfaces, which are kind of too small for us to notice in everyday life, although they're, they're, they're everywhere around us. And what the film does is it gives you um, a catalog of buildings. So um, uh, at the bottom of the screen, the name of the building we're looking at flashes up, um, but all we ever get to see of it is a microscopic image of the surface. There's no establishing shot. We never get to see what the building's actually like only the kinds of surfaces that make up the city at this level of proximity, at this scale. And then finally, the last film that I'm going to mention is um, uh, Balloon Tactic, uh, which was a kind of a the, the, the main failure, but an interesting failure, I think, which was w uh, one where I wanted to produce a kind of a DIY drone shot um, by um, attaching a small action camera to a bunch of helium balloons and sailing it out over the city um, on a fishing line. And then I thought, I thought kind of optimistically I could just reel it back in again and have a wonderful floating image, uh, a, a top-down image of the city. But actually, even the small amount of wind made it go crazy, and I was afraid I was going to kill somebody. So I, I reeled it back in uh, about a minute later, and I got um, uh, a film that is interesting, but not what I expected at all. And that was also projected onto the, the circular table. All of these films, by the way, will be available to watch on uh, a Vimeo channel and on uh, another online space once our book, um, Urban Sensographies, comes out, and it will be kind of related to that, but freely accessible. And then the last thing I'll, I'll talk about is uh, the sound main sound piece that I produced, because I also made sound recordings of this, the soundscapes of the city. Um, and this resulted in an album called Ring Road Ring that um, is my interpretation of the, uh, the sounds of the ring road. It was made using um, contact microphones that uh, attached to the concrete pylons that hold the road up. Um, and these kinds of microphones amplify vibrations. Um, they don't pick up sound in the air as much as sound moving through large objects, large materials. Uh, so attached to the, to the pylons, 
it amplified the vibrations, the big vibrations pulsing pulsing through the megastructure of the the Coventry Ring Road, um, and it sounded incredibly evocative once I listened, once I attached them and put my headphones on. So I made record several recordings of this, um, and then made some other tracks that were kind of um, interpretations, re reprocessings of them. And then it was released earlier this year um, by Grun Recorder, uh, which is this, a great German label that specializes in weird field recordings and things like that. Um, so you can buy it on uh, a record um, which has a lock groove in, in the center, which means that once the needle gets into that lock groove, it plays the sound of the, the ring road infinitely, um, uh, as if you're stuck driving around it forever and ever. Um, and that's where I'll stop. Thank you very much, Michael. That's a, actually a very interesting image you left us there with that <laughs> your one is stuck forever on the uh, Coventry Ring Road going round and round and round. But I, I think this has been a fascinating overview of a lot of different aspects which you both of you uh, explored in Coventry and a view on and through Coventry, which um, is very unusual. I, I I'd like to start, uh, I mean, there, there are millions of things we could talk about now, but I'd like to start with a question addressing both of you is because um, you're working in this, uh, or you worked and you are working in within a framework of academia, Carolyn, you, you're also working on an arts-based uh, PhD now, and Michael, you talk about art, your art, filmmaking and recording as a form of spatial critique. Um, as a, me as a medium of research, essentially. And, and art as research provides many opportunities, but also many challenges. And, and my first question really is, um, what was the main obstacle in sensing the city you uh, encountered and, and how did you overcome it? Do you, do you want to do this, Carol? Do you want to start, you want to start Michael? <laughs> Okay. Um, well, for me, uh, I suppose just personally, it, it's um, a bit of a, a shift in thinking, moving from a kind of research that I was trained to do, which is text-based and analytical and mm -hmm. um, rigorously methodological in, in the ways that are rigorous for my field, to a different kind of practice that um, is often more speculative, often equally rigorous, but with a different kind of rigor in mind. Uh, so making those two different ways of working coalesce uh, was interesting. And for a long time in my career, I've, I've, I kept them separate for a long time. And I did one thing in one sphere and another thing in another. And this project really was the first one that brought them together and made me do art stuff in an academic context. Yeah. Um, so I've, I've been learning a lot about this. And um, it's already a big question for um, practices research people who've been dealing with these uh, methodological questions for years. Mm -hmm. So I learned, I learned a lot from engaging with that work, um, but also was keen to find my own path through it as well and to figure out how the work, the kind of work I had been doing was useful, could be useful in some ways. And I think it's, it's, also, it's just a mind shift. In, it's not that I was doing a specific kind of, kind of art or being an artist in a specific kind of way. It's, it's really, it's, all, it's sometimes just a mind shift in terms of thinking about how, how actually that is a useful way of doing something or thinking about something, providing a kind of understanding about something. Carolyn, do you want to uh, add something to that? Or? Um, yeah, I guess actually it's interesting because I think Michael and I then um, maybe came from different ends of the spectrum. Mm -hmm. Although you've been a practicing artist for quite a while, I think. Um, in my case, I've, I've been, um, uh, kind of teaching in academia, but but doing the PhD and then doing this sense in the city um, meant engaging quite a bit more rigorously with theory and how theory could underlie the practice. Um, I'm quite fierce about the value of practice uh, within an academic space, so I feel excited about artists um, uh, Bringing bringing their practices into uh, and and the kind of knowledges that the practice can produce reveal um, and so on so so that was important but it also made me um, much more self conscious about what my practice was and how mm -hmm. my, what my practice usually 
did and how to challenge that, how, how you know, trying to find ways that that could um, grow and mature through the, the lens of it being practice research, I guess. So yeah, it, it's been a really interesting project. And, and also for me, really uh, quite wonderful to be working with this group of five artist researchers who were all part of Sensing the City. I've learned immensely from them. I mean, this, the, yeah, uh, thank you. I think it's, it's, for me, it's really interesting because you, um, and, and that's a question particularly aimed at you, Carolyn, um, you as an artist, you work mainly freelance um, and uh, a situation which is always precarious and even more so now in the current situation. Mm -hmm. And so my question is, how, how, has, uh, how has this art project led and funded by academia um, influenced your work? Have you perhaps sensed the city in a different way? Has it changed your sense of the city? Or um, and, and maybe what are, are these opportunities, are there other opportunities for artists to develop their work in that kind of way? Uh, well, I mean, in purely practical terms, it's unusual to have a three-year commission. Mm -hmm. So the fact that this was an Arts and Humanities Research Council project that spanned three years was very significant. Um, when you do pro project funded work, as I do, you're always looking for other funders and you need um, seed funding. So the fact that I was commissioned by Sensing the City then meant that I could attract other funders as well. Um, and as I outlined in the presentation, we undertook several periods of research and then um, shared performative outcomes from those periods of research. So it's been it was interesting to do the presentation because in a way, although I knew it, I hadn't completely uh, appreciated how much work was able to take place under this umbrella. So it's been, it's been fantastic. And I do, I do think that and I'm not alone. I, I have, I know other artists who are also um, making work in this kind of a space, but I think that research funding through universities, and through the Arts and Humanities Research Council is a place where perhaps we can find a home or you know more support. So yeah. yeah it's so it could contribute to artists making a living actually. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Michael, I've, I've got another question. Um, you talked about, um, in one of your slides, you mentioned a malfunctioning 21st century panorama of Coventry. <laughs> it's an intriguing term. Um, I'm very interested in the panorama as a, as a spatial exhibition method. And um, there is an artist called Yadiga Agassi, who has over the last few decades uh, developed uh, new panoramas across the world, mainly in Europe. Um, and I'd love to instigate a new panorama in Coventry. Uh, my question is now, I mean, particularly about the, uh, the maybe the post-war Coventry, which has been increasingly lost. My question is now, would you be interested? What do you think about that, of having a new panorama in Coventry? Uh, I think that's a great idea. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I would say that. Um, I think it would also be great to have a camera obscura. In mm -hmm. Coventry. We don't already have one. Um, and uh, but, but in terms of the panorama, I mean, I think that they are um, really interesting, um, archaic uh, exhibition forms. And the specific thing that's interesting about them that I think uh, that I, I was interested in the way they attempt to give you this stitching together of the whole of the city. Yeah. But also the other thing that's interesting about them is, is the, the the way they're installed, the way that they invite the viewer in, mm -hmm. the way that they require a kind of presence. Because actually if the best kind of, or at least the, the best um, uh, approximation of what the original panoramas were attempting to do is probably VR. You could do that with a, with a VR headset now. Yeah. Um, but um, there's something to be said, certainly, for being able to walk around the space and be present with the the image, um, and to have to walk around it and peruse it in that way mm -hmm. with yeah. other people. Um, I think there's something really um, it, there's there's some something additional that happens in that uh, I that encounter um, that is valuable. Um, so yeah, it would be great to have it. I, yeah. I, although I think um, uh, I think that the, the leap from the old-fashioned panorama to VR is a massive leap, and there's probably some other technological innovations in between that we might try out to do with adding moving images, because panoramas were always painted yeah. um, initially; they were always painted static images. And indeed, I think the the artist you mentioned uses still images, still at least in what I know of of his stuff that they're 
digital photographs. You are massive, massively uh, constructed, stitched together digital fo photographs. Um, but yeah. uh, I don't see what it would what would happen if you added moving images into that, or indeed uh, expanded the form to include other kinds, other senses, and that, that there would be lots of interesting experiments to happen in between. And maybe there's an interesting link to be made with the history of expanded cinema as well to link these two things, because yeah. expanded yeah. cinema was interested in creating immersive environments less interested in the illusionistic and more in combining all sorts of different uh, media flows and sources and feeds into mm. overwhelming spectacles. And um, Ch Charles and Ray Eames were doing this kind of thing in the 60s with their, they, they, they did a thing for the World Fair that was a kind of a big a proto IMAX experience that involved multiple screens and multiple data sources, all kinds of films being yeah. played at yeah. the same time. Yeah, and, 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 and Stan Vanderbeek's movie drone is the other great example of that, which is which is kind of like a panorama, but also confusing and overwhelming. Yeah, I, absolutely. I mean, what is interesting about Agassi's work is that he actually reuses existing buildings. He uses uh, gasometers, redundant gasometers, uh, yeah. which he then turns into panoramas, which is quite interesting. But yeah. you mentioned also the um, uh, camera obscura that we could have one actually a camera obscura is sometimes um created spontaneously i've been once in an old uh, monastery in, in in a roof in a monastery in, in austria and suddenly the whole uh, courtyard appeared on on some surface because there was a tiny hole in the roof which through which the camera obscura spontaneously appeared which was quite a magic moment yeah, yeah. it is magical <laughs> so isn't it? Could find it in some roofscapes in this in in the in, in Coventry, maybe in the um, mm. cathedral or somewhere. Yeah. yeah. Um, Carolyn, I'm 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 quite intrigued by the emphasis on the body in your relationship with the city and and the the overlap you talk about between performance and everyday life and uh, the audience experience, as you call it. And in in the sensing the city um, symposium, you also refer to native Canadians, obviously a close you know your background relating to your background and their understanding of uh, what they call all our relations and including the wild the pagan the female the way you talked about it how, how did or does this manifest for you in coventry Carolyn, you're on mute uh, i think you need to unmute yourself <laughs> Yeah, sorry, thank you. Um, yes, um, my work for quite some time has been thinking about um, humans within cities and um, being not separate from whatever we call nature, you know, this idea that there's this thing that's nature that's separate from us. So that's something that's um, um, discussed in a lot of academic kind of theoretical worlds, the post human um, and so on, humans and non humans. Um, um and bringing in the idea of the of first nations or indigenous ideas is one way to think that through um so um there are different cosmologies we the the whole idea of of um the wild as something or nature as being something separate from this world this the kind of urban world is a very european idea originally um and in some ways, it was a it was a way to um, to oppress and colonize uh, the other, um, which uh, would include the kind of indigenous people that I was referring to. Um, actually, it's that although those populations have suffered terribly in terms of um, um, uh, colonial impacts on their populations and culture, uh, which has almost decimated that it has not com disappeared completely and so this idea of um of relation was really important in the work in coventry to to try and bring back the thought that we live in relation to the world and the world of the city is something that i've termed the urban wild so it's a it's a hybrid situation uh that incorporates living things uh human systems uh, so all kinds of circulations that might be weather or they might be uh, sewage um, systems and so on. So all of those, all of those um, human made and natural um, systems and beings um, are all part of 
are all things that we are in relation to all the time, whether or not we notice it. Um, so in making this performance work, um, I try to uh, in, enhance people's noticing of their own relations yeah. in the world. And that, so hence um, referring to this idea. And it's in the indigenous people that I was referring to in Canada, and I think this is kind of not just Canada, um, often will say all my relations as a, as a kind of a ongoing honoring of that awareness. And all my relations is not just about my relations in this time and space, but it's also going backwards in time and forwards in time. Uh, it's the ancestors as much as any as as the future generations uh, of humans and non-humans, weather systems, mountains, rocks, everything. Mm -hmm. um, so yes, all of that was um, something that I tried to bring into the Coventry space. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah that's really interesting. And, and it's, it's, it's this what you're talking about, taking note, isn't it? Taking, being aware of where you are with your body in a space, but also being aware of what you sense and what you, but also aware of memories, associations, because all this comes into it when we actually stop and listen to ourselves, isn't it? Rather than rushing through things. And, yeah. and so we can find poetry in, in, in in and under the ring road or, you know, and in Coventry and lots of other places which are not conventional. Yeah, yeah. you know, the, kind of the ground zero for all of us is we live in a body and, it, mm. and the body and the senses is how we, we receive the world. But we have, as you say, memory, we have memory and we have um, uh, experiences that are present for us within, within the kind of space that we inhabit in this moment. So, so there's this kind of give and take between um, the remembered space, the the um, the embodied and sensed space. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to follow up on that immediately with you because you've worked also extensively with digital devices, and in one of your projects, you worked across four cities uh, across the globe simultaneously, which is is, is fascinating. Um, obviously, that was before COVID-19 and you couldn't have anticipated this. But do you think that this um, uh, these kind of methods uh, give um, now uh, give um, are given additional artistic validity or do you think we are all yearning more to go back to our real or to more physical existence? Um, and a stronger return to, to this in sensory interaction. And so maybe there is a, especially in this current prevalent feeling, and I like the term you use, two-dimensionality, feeling two-dimensional. You know, we, that's what we are doing now, sitting in front of a screen, talking to each other rather than being in a room together. Yeah. Do, 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 where, where do you think this is going or will be going? Oh, obviously, this is not new. You know, people have been um, engaging with screen worlds and embodied worlds for long, for you know, for some years, yeah, yeah. Um, I think that this whole COVID nineteen situation is a giant experiment, which um, is, I mean, I've had quite a few invitations over the last couple of months to devise things for the screen. So, so, so in actually, my my experiments with the embodied world in relation to the screen world have intensified mm -hmm. and, and taken. You know, um, I'm joining everybody else in this experiment. Um, I think what the thing we did with Skype was not just, uh, of course, anybody can set up a group Skype conversation or Zoom or whatever, um, but it was about what happens when you do that. You know, are, how, how can you stay? Can you? We've all seen the people who wander through the urban space so wrapped up in their screens that they mm. bump into people or they, they, they're not really present in the world. And so my challenge to the three performers I worked with for that piece of uh, research was stay as intensely engaged with your embodied space as you can with those two other people who mm -hmm. are on the screen. And what does that do? So, um, so how do how do you respond to them in real time at the same time as you respond in real time to the world? Um, so that was the task. And I'm still interested in uh, that. Actually, that that quote that I used or that that statement about I feel two dimensional that came from a, an audience member who came to Urban Flows in September last year. Um, not in relation to a screen, although they were required to use a screen at different points in the piece. So I don't know if that was part of what made that person feel two dimensional. But um, I, yeah, I, I just think it's a it's of the moment 
currently, but it's something that we're increasingly engaging with screens. And where yeah. do the bodies go in that in that case? Yeah. I mean, the, the, that, the question of dimension is really interesting because you, Michael, you talk about one of your uh, sub themes is looking up. Um, and and within within um, Coventry Modern, the project I'm uh, currently involved with is uh, we 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 were planning to do a midnight walk uh, in Coventry, looking up because to me this is not really a question; it's more a comment. It's uh, looking up is so important from an architectural point of view. The more interesting things often happen above the first floor. You know, when you look up, there is where all the uh, there's much less altered. You have much more history in in buildings. You know, and 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 you have a lot of things happening which are beyond your normal straight looking straight forward or worst case scenario looking down on your phone and so it's um it's actually interesting this these these questions of dimensionality coming into it and more we are being more aware of it now um i'm aware of the time also and uh, I, I think you'd like to invite some audience question but i just want to finish on one last question maybe we can do that quite quickly because um sensing the city was also called an an, an urban a pop up urban room and, and it was one of the catalysts of bringing more urban room uh, initiatives together in, in Coventry, which isn't happening now. Um, obviously, this goes back to um, the final review of architecture and the built environment in 2014, but also much further back because there are connotations of the urban salon, another word you use, you know, associated with the enlightenment and, and, and the urban sphere and discussing urban problems. So my question is, uh, regarding your work and 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 also referring to an intention expressed in the project which talks about sensitizing the user giving people a license to inhabit space differently in addressing the problems of the city how do you envisage your work to involve uh, uh, further in engaging the public with the public sphere especially in this uh, ongoing crisis but beyond that and specifically in Coventry um well uh, I mean, one thing is that the project is is finished. So um, we it had ended just before the pandemic. So one question is how w whether it would be worthwhile uh, whether uh, main, maintaining this kind of interest and this kind of work ex in investigating the city. Um, and yes, I think it probably would be. Um, the uh, the the thing that that happens now is that the city doesn't visibly change, but the way people relate to it changes so there's something about that what we were i think all addressing in some way which is the kind of psychical forces of the space what they do to people how they make people feel as you move around different spaces in the city that will change profoundly in the short term and in the long term it's difficult to say yet but in the short term they're going to change profoundly so um that sense of developing methods to examine how spaces make you feel um is i think more vital than ever now that now that those forces are shifting without the physical structure actually shifting very much. Mm. Um, yeah. Carolyn, do you want to add to that? <laughs> um, my, I, I wanted to ask a cheeky question, which is, um, you know, is this screen world also part of Coventry or where is this? You know, where are we at the moment? Isn't this also the city? Mm. And if it is the city, which city is it, you know? Yeah, but well, I mean, ultimately, if we if and when we return all to much more physicality in terms of where we move around and all that, my, the question is, and the question for urban room is, mm. how to influence place making and 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 where where all this work you've been doing, all these really interesting aspects you've been exploring, how do they actually feed into quite hard nosed public uh, policy making and build environment decision planning architecture all that i think this we, we need to find a way of of bringing that into it i think uh, we have got five minutes now just over five minutes and there has been one question particularly from alison lloyd who wants to know uh, what your phd topic is carolyn and um um and, and whether it links to this project um my yes it links completely so uh, I used the opportunity of this research project to um, also feed into the PhD thinking. Um, and I could give you the title of my research, but it's, um, it's looking, it, I'll, I'll sort of give a translation. It's, it's about how we become, um, our lives are an ongoing process of, of uh, becoming it, who we will, 
who we are uh, in relation to the urban wild. So the urban wild, the city being this kind of field of, of relations. Um, and so my question was, what does it mean to choreograph an audience experience that helps the audience to um, notice uh, their entanglement in that everyday situation? Um, I've also used the word Anthropocene in framing what I'm doing, and that's purely uh, the Anthropocene is a very contested term that um, is trying to say that humans, but of course it's not all humans, um, have had an impact on the Earth system to the point where in the future geological layers of the Earth there will be techno-fossils like uh, concrete and electronics and um, uh, radiation and so on, things that will um, demonstrate that this was a period where human beings and human technologies um, had a massive impact on the earth. So uh, I use that term as a way of saying this is happening in this particular um, point in earth's history. But it's also an interesting idea to draw on because it invites us to consider what this world is in huge term uh, ter in terms of time and duration. Um, what does it mean to be uh, a human being living in a particular place um, that is 2.5 billion years from the point when oxygen first started to be part of our atmosphere, for example. Anyway, so it's quite mind blowing. That's that you bring in the question of archaeology and it links again to what what we talked earlier or michael talked earlier the ruin uh, how the ruin is um well it's part of this uh, both the past and the future in a way or uh, and, and this whole idea of uh, having the longer view as it were of, over everything mm. Mm. yeah are there any other questions from the audience? I mean, it's, we could still, if somebody wants to post one, we could still answer one more question, perhaps. <laughs> I can't see that at the moment, but I can see that um, uh, Kate has uh, uh, posted the links uh, to the project, to uh, Simon's Crossing, and to Michael, your uh, to your um, uh, website as well. So. So that's, there's a lot of stuff people can uh, follow up on. I mean, we've discussed, we've touched on so many aspects here. That there, is, there is so much more material to, to discuss. And I hope we can continue our discussions um, in one way or another uh, in the future. It's been fascinating looking at your work, um, being part of it to some extent, and now um, talking to you about it. Thank you so much, Carolyn, Debbie, and Michael Piggott. This has been really interesting. And I'd also like to thank the Arts and Place group who instigated this, uh, as Arts and Place now, who instigated this uh, series. And I, I think it's a fantastic idea to um, bring artists' work to the forefront and, and, and uh, yeah, instigate discussions and conversations. And I'd love to also want to say, particularly Kate uh, Watson from BEAM, who has been so <laughs> behind all this and made all this possible. And of course, I'd like to uh, thank everybody who's been here today. Uh, in the audience and uh, and um, um, yeah we hope to hear more of you see more of you and for the time being it's uh, it's goodbye from Carolyn and goodbye from Michael and goodbye from me goodbye, goodbye.